the Millennium Campus Network, we believe in student leaders and student-based organizations advancing global development. Young people have many innovative ideas and talents that could change the world. My student organization is Banjika. We create educational workshops and products to foster youth-driven innovation and entrepreneurship around the world. We are preparing the next generation of global leaders to challenge the paradigms that perpetuate inequality, to reimagine a human-centric approach to global development, and to improve their impact, uh, specifically by supporting their organization's operations, partnerships, resources, and leadership transitions. MCN's been around for six years. In that journey, we've empowered and educated over 5,000 student leaders from 300 campuses. And those students, uh, they're incredible. They're part of organizations like UNICEF, uh, Engineers Without Borders, Globe Med, Partners in Health. They're a part of this network. While there were opportunities to donate your time and a lot of opportunities to donate your money, there weren't any opportunities to develop your skills as a student leader. That's sort of where MCN fit the bill. Because of the curriculum that the fellowship provides these students, I was able to challenge the status quo and dig deeper into some of the failures that were occurring in the, in the international development sector and realize that as a student, as an undergrad, I was able to take on some of these challenges in a different way. A student organizer is someone who takes upon themselves to basically, from scratch, create something from nothing in order to advance some cause. And I feel that I'm that type of person, that I may not be the most skilled, I may not be the most knowledgeable, but I am the one willing to put my heels in the ground and actually work hard to push forward an idea I believe in. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, usually at an event, I have to say that twice, but this is an energetic group. Wow. Um, who here, by a show of hands, uh, performed last night? Did any of you perform last night? No? Yeah? You and you. Can, can you all give these uh, two or three people a huge round of applause? <laughs> to be honest, um, so this is my first time with IYF, and I did not know what to expect coming here. <clears throat> they told me, Sam, you're going to speak this morning, but they said, Dan said to me, well, could you come last night for this opening uh, ceremonies, and I didn't know what it was going to be like. Um, that was one of the most unbelievable performances and evenings I've seen in my entire life, so thank you. Thank you. So for me, uh, my name is Sam Vagar. I am the executive director of the Millennium Campus Network, MCN for short. And uh, I'm here from Boston, so that's home for me. Um, <laughs> I'm almost speechless because I've traveled all over the world. Um, to share our story and our work, but I am mesmerized and captivated by your community, uh, by what you do, and by what moves you and speaks to you. Uh, it's, it's incredibly rare, um, the kind of energy that you have in this room. And so I think, honestly, the first thing I want to do, instead of telling you my story, is <clears throat> I just want to hear from a couple of you uh, who you are, um, who you are, and uh, when it comes to the world that we're all a part of, what it is that speaks to you, what, what it is that you care most about. So I know that at most events I've gone to, uh, no one likes to be first, but I always appreciate most the person who raises their hand first, because to me that's it's a special kind of leadership. 
Um, and I'll, I'll share why in my talk. But does anyone want to share your name, where you're from, and, um, and really what speaks to you in the world? Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> now you're good. You got it. You got it. This thing work. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. How's everybody doing today? Good. Yeah. A little bit more enthusiasm. Come on. A little Woo! More. There we go. There we go. I like that. Uh, my name is Ronald. What's good? <laughs> uh, well, this is the first time I came to an IYF camp. My my brother Gerber, I think he's in the back. He like you know. Through our dance group in our church, they kind of like told us about this and it's like, it's been quite an experience, you know. I mean, first day was kind of like, you know, a little rocky, you know, had to wait for my luggage a long time, but a long time. I know a couple of, here, a couple of people here had to do that too, but um, yeah, it's a really nice experience. And for, really nice. for you, Ronald, what is it, I mean, what do you care about in the world? What do I care about in the world? Yeah. Hmm. What do I care about in the world? <laughs> I want to change the world. I want to change the world. Um. <laughs> so, so you don't have to. I mean, your friends are giving you their perspective, but um, honestly, just for you, right? As as one person, you've seen the world. You're young, but you've seen enough of the world to know what's right and what is working, and what's uh, wrong and what needs to change. What is it that speaks to you? What do you want to see? Uh, different in the world for yourself or your friends or your family or for in general yeah I kind of want to see like I see like a lot of the youth you know and like uh, I see a lot of them in, like they're in some like wrong places with wrong people so I kind of want to like you know change that you know some of them don't don't really know uh, or don't have anybody to look up to or talk to or like confess my problems, or I want to talk to someone, yeah. but they don't have anybody. So you know they look for like the wrong way. You know, so. Yeah. Um, I guess thank you very much, Ron. Uh, yeah. One. One more. So I see. Yeah. I see your hand raised. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Demaris Rodriguez. Um, I found out about the work camp about three weeks ago. So I was very busy with my life, going to school, internship. I'm a student at Lehman College pursuing my bachelor degree at 43 in health education and promotion. So it can be done. Wow. So I believe God had a plan for me because I was very busy. I had a lot of things to do. And this week was like off, like, Okay, this is it. You could do it. Um, three weeks I planned. I brought my girls. I am a foster parent. I encounter a lot of children in foster care that believe that they're worthless, that they have nobody that loves them. So I saw this opportunity because I want to show them that there's more to life and that even though they're in the ground, they can rise to the top. And <laughs> so 
So there's a lot of great opportunities out there, and we just got to look for them and grab them when we see them. And I think that uh, uh, why, uh, why I, I'm sorry, that, that IYF can offer that. So please um, take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. Thank you. So um, I, uh, I'll try and come back to you at the end. I saw your hand was raised, so I will. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing. And um, Ronald, uh, thank you, because I could tell, you know, he, he was, you could tell he was a little nervous, and you just stepped up and you did it. So thank you very much. So I, I want to I echo um, what the three of you shared, and I want to share my story, our story at MCN, um, and really provide what I hope is helpful context as you think about your lives and your careers and incorporating social impact and making a difference in the world in everything that you do. And so for me, uh, my story started in high school. Uh, how many of you, are any of you in high school right now, some of you? So for, for you who are in high school, um, I want to share a little bit of my story uh, because Dan told me thematically to focus on challenge and change and cohesion and for me, high school was very challenging. So I had, uh, how, who here again is in high school? Okay, so for you, uh, maybe some of you are popular, you have friends, you have friends here. <laughs> I had exactly two friends in high school. That's it. I had one date all four years. It was a blind date for senior prom. So I, I was too nervous to even uh, ask the young woman that I liked on a date. So my friend set me up. And so that was my high school experience. And so for me, in high school, I didn't really, I didn't fit in. Um, I didn't really know what my what my purpose was, uh, what my voice was. It would have been oftentimes very difficult for me to do something like this with all of you. That was my high school experience. I applied to 17 colleges and universities, if you can believe that. And most of those schools rejected me. They said, Sam, we don't want you. <clears throat> now, at this point, you're thinking, okay, so the person speaking to us had two friends in high school, one date, and a bunch of rejection letters. Why did IYF decide to send Sam to you? It doesn't make much sense. But what happened to me when I was 18 and 19 changed my life and is the reason why I'm here today. And so when I was 18, 19 years old, I realized that in high school, I was so shy. Uh, you, you all know the difference between introverts and extroverts? Who, who here, by a show of hands, is an introvert? That's actually impressive, number one, that, that you're all introverts. Number two, that you're willing to raise your hand because a lot of introverts are shy. And, and who here is an extrovert? Okay. For me, for me, naturally, naturally I'm actually an introvert. So I'm an introvert. And so for me, uh, it was really hard just to meet people. Just actually reaching out and connecting with people. And that's why in high school I was more on the outside watching other people. When I got to college... The first day I was there, I said, mm, this is my challenge. 
that my whole life up until 18, I've been watching other people get out there and enjoy life and make the most of their opportunities, and I'm sitting watching them. But we're all on the same planet, so what am I doing? So once I got to college on the first day of school, the first opportunity that I had, I reached out and I said, hi, I'm Sam. It's good to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Hey, I'm Sam. How are you? Good to meet you. Hey, Sam, good to meet you. Sam, good to meet you. And honestly, it was that easy. It was that easy to break those barriers and start to realize that I don't have to just live in my shell. I can find my voice and myself. And so that was me at the very beginning of college. But what did I do at the the first semester? Ronald, it's kind of what you talked about. So my first semester of college, that whole time, honestly what I did, I went out and partied. I had a great time because I made up for four years of high school where I didn't. (laughs) So that was was my first semester Uh, first year in college. And then I read two books that changed my life. And so anyone who ever says, oh, a book can't change your life, yeah, it can. Uh, It definitely can. And so I started to learn about the world. There's a book that I always recommend to people. Um, And so whatever age you are, there's this book called Mountains Beyond Mountains. And I recommend it to everyone, whether you're a reader or not. And believe me, I wasn't, but I read this book, <clears throat> Mountains Beyond Mountains. This book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, talks about a doctor named Paul Farmer and an organization called Partners in Health. And when Paul was 23 years old, he left Harvard University and he went down to Haiti. And I know IYF has camp, English camp in Haiti. He went down to Haiti for the first time. He actually stole medical supplies from Harvard. <laughs> And he brought him down to Haiti, and he started working. And he's now been working with his team more than 25 years in nine countries around the world on the cutting edge of global health. In 2014, in the news, everyone was talking about Ebola in West Africa. And Paul and Partners in Health were on the front lines of response. They called on his team uh, and this organization to respond because of how effective they are in global health. And then I read a second book called... The End of Poverty by an economist named Jeffrey Sachs. And so I learned about the complexities of extreme poverty. The fact that as we're all sitting here so blessed, so fortunate to be here, there are 1.2 billion people on planet Earth. 1.2 billion people. I'm going to repeat that. 1.2 billion people who are living on less than $1.25 a day. And what that means in human terms, it's a lack of access to education, to health care, to clean, safe drinking water, to shelter, to a lot of the things that every person should be fundamentally afforded as their basic human rights. And that is sorely lacking in our world today. And so at 19, I learned about this. And I said, wow, I've been sitting here, what you talked about, Ronald, sorry to keep calling you out, but... You told me. It's the truth. So many people, when they're young, it's about us. We're self-centered. It's about our story and what we care about and having a good time. And all of a sudden, I realized, wait a sec, we're here for a purpose. We're here to do something bigger than ourselves. And so when I was 19, I put down this book, The End of Poverty. I picked up the phone, and I called the author, this economist, Jeffrey Sachs. I had never met him before, never heard of him, but I read the book. He had this big role at the United Nations, tackling poverty around the world. I said, I want to be a part of it. So two days later, I came from Boston down to Columbia University in New York, met with his team. I said, look, I'm a college sophomore. I have very few of the answers. I know that, but I know our generation can do more. When it comes to global health and global education and empowering young people around the world, I know we have a role to play, and I want to figure out what that role is. And so we came back to campus, and we started fundraising, very small first. We did bake sales. We teamed up with other people on campus. And one of the things I learned is that there is power in numbers. There's power when we work together. That if it's just us alone, it's really, really hard. But when you take a step back and you realize that every one of us is connected, that we're all part of the same family, that we can actually build something together, 
all of a sudden things change. And so that's what we did. We started reaching out to people all across Boston and then nationally and globally. And we had our first conference, MCC, in 2008 at MIT. And we didn't know what to expect. And we reached out, and a thousand students from around the world came together. And Paul Farmer, Jeff Sachs, uh, a little known singer you may have heard of, his name is John Legend, uh, the, head of, the, the head of USAID, all these global leaders participated. Paul, John, Jeff joined our board of advisors, and they said, Sam, team, go build this. And so that's what we've spent the last eight years doing is building MCN. And what we do at MCN is we're uniting and training the next generation of social impact leaders on university campuses around the world. So how many of you are in college right now or are going to be in college soon? So for all of you, you're our target population. You're who we work with on a daily basis. And what we're working on is cultivating a generation of ethical effective, engaged leaders. Ethical, effective, and engaged. And those three words are really important to us because when we talk about moving from challenge to change, when it comes to real change, it's about getting real about what's in your mind and what's in your heart. And so for us, and that was something that when Pastor Park spoke last night really resonated with me, it was talking about opening our hearts, that that's where real change emanates from. And so for me, what we teach in our curriculum is when you're going into community, whether it's locally or in Haiti or around the world, one, core values, empathy and humility. And you're nodding your head, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you go into a community, a lot of 18 to 21 year olds in college think they have all the answers. I have, the, I have it all figured out. I'm going to go solve a community's problems. Not true. <laughs> Imagine if somebody came to you today and said, I have it all figured out. I'm going to solve your problems. You'd say, I don't think so. Thanks, but no thanks. Because every person has their own story. We have a connected story, but we're also individuals. And so for us, empathy and humility, understanding other people, not judging people, but loving people, judging less, loving more, that's at the heart of our curriculum. Humility, humility, yeah, you can clap for that, yeah. Humility because we don't have all the answers, but we can find the answers together when we reflect and when we learn together. Humility is fundamental. And then core management skills. So we actually teach people uh, how to write a budget, how to write a business plan, how to manage a team, how to manage a team through conflict. Because if you're serious about change, if you really want to see the world change, Ronald, what you talked about when you talked about young people being disengaged and disaffected and going in a different path, if you want to change that and you're serious about that, if you're really serious about that, what it takes is really thinking tactically, strategically, philosophically, but tact tactically, how do you actually do it? And so that's what we do at MCN. We help provide a blueprint so that you can actually engage with nonprofits and community members around the world in a meaningful, intentional way. We've been doing this now eight years, and our alums are now working at the United Nations. They're working in the U.S. government. They're actually running their own social ventures around the world. And so that's been our story. We've worked so far with 5,500 young people from 300 universities around the world. And our invitation to you is to join us, as I know members of IYF have, is to join us uh, at our conference through our fellowship and for us in turn to join you and really connect with you. And so that's been the heart of MCN for eight years. What I want to share with you is uh, really some of the key lessons that I've learned, um, the key lessons that have made that change possible. And so for me, it all started when I was 18 years old. I talked about the two books that I read, but there was a moment, an experience when I was 18 that made me who I am as a person. And so when I was 18, I was walking along the street in Washington, D.C. And I was walking along the street, and I came across, I came across a man who's homeless. 
Now, normally, what do you do when you see somebody homeless on the side of the street? You keep walking. I actually do something even worse. Sometimes I pretend I'm on a call when I'm not even on a call. I just have my phone up so I can ignore even making eye contact with the person. This one time at 18 years old in Washington, D.C., I felt disconnected with the world, and I realized that this was my opportunity to do something different. So in this moment, what I did was I sat down with this man who's homeless. And so we sat together on the sidewalk in the bitter cold in January, and we shared lunch. And we shared lunch for about 45 minutes, and 20 minutes into the conversation, I looked at this man, and I asked him, I said, I don't mean to be rude, but I grew up outside of Boston in the suburbs. I have no understanding, no context for what your lived experience has been. And so I just, if I can ask you this one question, the one question I have is, how do you survive? And he looked back at me, and he looked at the passerby, and he said, I'm not afraid to talk to anyone. I'm not afraid to look up at those above me and ask for help. Never be afraid to talk to anyone. Never be afraid to talk to anyone. So I'm, I'm 30 now. And that's the best piece of advice I've received in my entire life. And it didn't happen in the classroom. It didn't happen talking to a professor. It didn't happen talking to a world leader. It happened talking to a man who is homeless. And to be honest with you, you have plenty of people who are going to talk to you all week about faith. But if I could, I would just say, That is where God works. God works with the poor and through the poor. And so often our society labels and marginalizes groups of people and tells you not to talk to those people and tells you they don't have the answers when they do. And so for me, that's what happened. I In that one conversation... As someone who was shy my whole life growing up, this one man taught me never be afraid to talk to anyone. And so I took that advice. And I went to a conference in in 2010 in Miami. And there was uh, an actor in there. His name's Cal Penn. I don't know if any of you have seen a a movie named, it's called The Namesake. uh, Or a movie called Harold and Kumar. Yeah, like I hate that that's the reference point, but that's the reference point. So Kumar and Harold and Kumar, um, this actor, Cal Penn, he had, he had left Hollywood for a little while, so you know what I'm talking about. He had left Hollywood for a little while, and he went to work in the White House on public engagement to engage people around the country. And so he was at this event, so if you don't mind standing up for a moment, yeah, if you. Yeah, you. Um, so if you imagine being... Uh, if you can imagine that this is Cal Penn, right? This famous actor, everybody's like, wow, it's Cal. So everyone's kind of watching you as they are right now. And everyone's like, oh, I can't, I can't go say hi. Oh, my God, it's Cal Penn. I can't believe it. It's Cal Penn. And in this moment, I was scared too. I was really nervous. And then I thought, what did that man teach me? And so that was it. I knew that as scared as I was, that this work is about more than just us. It's about something much bigger. And so never be afraid to talk to anyone. I came right up and I said, hey, Cal, how are you? I'm good. Excellent. Uh, How's your day so far? Tiring. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, And I'm Sam Vagar, and I had an organization called MCN. And we are a leadership development program for college undergrads, really tackling some of the world's biggest challenges. How does that sound? Good. Oh, so uh, are there any ways maybe we could work together, you think? Yeah, sure. So literally, that was a really good impression. Give them a round of applause. (laughs) 
literally, you can have a seat. So literally, it was that simple. And so what happened in that moment, that was a really good reenactment. What happened in that moment, Cal said, well, actually, Sam, that's really interesting. I work in the White House now. Would you, would you want to come uh, to the White House in two weeks and talk more about this? And I said, you know, Cal, I'm pretty busy. So, um, I, no, I was like, of course I'm going to the White House. So two weeks later, uh, so here's what happened. It was a couple key pieces of advice, and these are actual concrete things that I've done to create change that I wanted to share with all of you. The first thing I did, I made sure, as I'm going to do with you right now, I bring business cards. Always ask for a card if somebody has one. Just say, hey, I'd love to keep in touch. Do you have a card? It's a simple step, but that's how we actually connected. And so Cal gave me uh, (laughs) his card, your card, and said, yeah, okay, let's connect. The next rule that I always live by in this work is to follow up with somebody within 24 hours. So if you connect with somebody and you really want to stay engaged, follow up over email, by phone, however, within 24 hours. And that's exactly what I did. And so I reached out to you. I said it was incredible meeting you and I'd love to keep in touch. And then I came to the White House and met. The next step is, and by the way, the reason that's important You can meet somebody here this week, but if you wait three months to make a decision to reach out, the energy's gone. The energy that you feel when you watch people on stage here is really special and unique, but you feel it in the moment, so it's important to build those connections, make those commitments in the moment. And so for me, that's what happened. And so I then did something really important that somebody at the Cordes Foundation taught me to do which is you can go into any business meeting, any connection that you meet, meet someone here, meet someone around the world, and there's something you can do that changes the dynamic. There's a question. It's five, five simple words that you ask in a question that changes the dynamic of a meeting. It can completely transform a meeting. Does anyone know what that question might be that makes you uh, really seem valuable to the people around you? Anyone have a guess? Yeah. Do you believe in Jesus? So that's one key question you can ask. Any others? Yeah. What is important to you? So, and what was your name? Kathleen? So, the question that I ask that's similar to what is important to you is a question that Ron Cordes taught me to ask, which is, how can I help you? How can I help you? Because so often when we go somewhere, when we walk through our lives, people think it's about us, and you have something to give me, and I need your help. And the truth is, every one of us matters. Every one of us has purpose and gifts to give and share. And so when you ask somebody, how can I help you, you realize that we can actually help each other. And so that's what I did with you, Cal. I reached out, and I reached out again and again and again. And in business and in life and in starting a nonprofit, the key is to be persistent. And so that's what I did. I kept reaching out, and I said, how can I help you? And the first month, the second month, the third month, every time you said, no, 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 I don't need your help. I don't need your help. We're fine at the White House. We have it all figured out. We're solving all the world's problems. I said, great, okay, we're good. And then in the 10th month, I reached out. And I don't know if you remember what happened, Cal, but this is what happened in that 10th month. I reached out, and you said, actually, Sam, there is a way you can be helpful. There is a way. We're organizing at the White House Youth Roundtables. We want to hear from young people around the country on the issues you all care most about. And so what we did at MCN, we organized young people on college campuses around the country to talk about the biggest challenges in the world, but also what our generation can do from uh, sexual assault on campuses to global health disparities to climate change, what our generation can do to respond. And so three weeks later, you invited me back to the White House. And we, have any of you been to the White House? Have you been in the West Wing? So you know the West Wing is actually really small. I thought, you know, watching on TV would be huge. Walk in, really small. And we walk into the West Wing, 
And President Obama's press secretary walks by and he says, hey, how's it going? And we're like, uh, I don't know, it's good. I, I really is just shocked. And then we walked into this small room. Cal invited us in. You invited us in. And you said, hey, here's, you know, here's the Roosevelt room. And we walk in. And all, all the Roosevelt room is is just one table. Just one table. And there was just uh, 13 young people. So 13 young people from across the country talking about the issues that we cared most about as a generation. And we sat down with Cal Penn, with Valerie Jarrett, different leaders in the administration, and we talked about these issues. And halfway through the meeting, you stepped out of the meeting, and, and you said, I'll be back in five minutes. We said, that's great. So five minutes later, you see this stage, right? It's just a stage. Right? <laughs> so imagine that this is a wall. And imagine that the wall just opens up. And so five minutes later, this wall just opens up. And everybody's shocked. They don't really know what to expect. And in this moment, as this wall opens up, in comes... Bo Obama, the dog, comes bounding in. And we're like, what is going on? And then right behind Bo Obama, in comes Barack Obama. And he says, hi, I'm Barack Obama. We're like, yeah, we know who you are. <laughs> and so that moment was, of course, really special. But it was also one where we knew we had to make the most of the opportunity. And in any meeting, while you're here at World Camp with IYF, in any meeting, have a sense of purpose of what you want out of that experience because it means so much more when you have goals and objectives that you're striving for. And so in this meeting, we came in before the meeting with handwritten cards for the president and the first lady. And we said, here's our story. Here's how we want to get involved and it want to involve you. And so if I could imagine that you're President Obama, if you don't mind standing for a moment. So this is President Obama, the President of the United States. <clears throat> and so... So the president has walked into the room, and we wanted to make the most of that opportunity. So the president comes around to shake our hands, and I said, hi, I'm Sam from Boston. And my name is President Obama. <laughs> and this is a really good reenactment, too. And so this moment, honestly, just connecting, we came prepared. So I shook your hand, and I knew you had to talk to everyone else. So I pulled out a couple notes, and I put them in your hand. Do you remember what you said in the moment? Yes. What can I help you with? Yeah. Actually, so this is exactly what happened. Please give the president a round of applause. And so th this is what happened in that moment. The president, so you were really gracious. In this moment, the president was actually shocked because very few people actually hand, the, hand letters to the president. I'm sure the Secret Service hated it. But I didn't care because in this moment, you got to make the most of your opportunities. Just like when you're here right now, to make the most of this week. And so for us, in that moment, we connected. We had that moment. And you actually sat right across the table from me. And so we were just, I mean, you can, you can see it in the photo, but we're just across the table from each other. And you talk for about 15 minutes about the power of our generation, about the power of every single one of us in this room, about why it's important to start making impact as a teenager in your 20s, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, not to wait until you're 80 and 90 to give back, but that it starts now. And so for us, in that moment, we connected. And about 15 minutes in, you said, hey, thank you, thank you. And I could tell you were getting ready to go. You're the president. I get it. You have a few meetings, a few things to do. And so we figured, let's make the most of this opportunity. What did that man teach me? What did that man teach me in Washington, D.C. on the street? And so that's what I did. I had to get your attention, and there was only one way I knew how. So as you were saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, I raised my hand. And that's why to each of the three of you who raised your hand at the beginning, that's where change begins. That's why it's, it's, it's so foundational. It's so important. Because each time we raise our hand and raise our voice and affirm it, 
it actually touches and moves people in really powerful ways. And oftentimes, it's the people who we, like Ronald, you, who maybe wasn't as excited to reach out at first, but you had the guts and the courage to do it. That's where change begins, when you get out of your comfort zone. And that's what I did. So I raised my hand to the President of the United States, and the President says, thank you, thank you. And then he sees me. And he's like, Sam, go ahead. I said, thank you, Mr. President. I said, first of all, your leadership is a bold statement. Because whether, whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever your, whatever your politics. When I was 10 years old, when I was, when I was 10, if you had told me somebody named uh, Barack Hussein Obama would be President of the United States of America, I wouldn't have believed you. Honestly, I wouldn't have. And I said to you that your leadership is a bold statement. And then I said that, look, we want to invite you and the first lady to get involved in the work we're doing. <laughs> and everyone laughed at me. And I'm sure you all know how it feels when people laugh at you and you feel like you don't quite fit in. Everyone, la everyone in the room laughed at me because I'm pitching the president in front of the whole room. But I didn't care. A month later, I got a call from the State Department, and the government asked me to share our story and our curriculum with youth in Bosnia and Herzegovina, so I did that in 2011. They called again. We went to Morocco in 2013. In 2015, we went to Macedonia and Bulgaria. We've traveled all over the world from the UN to major universities and beyond, and in every part of that story, in, in, in every part of that story, what I have been struck by in every group, no matter where, no matter when, there are young people on this planet in every community committed to change. Every community. And what our, what our society has done has marginalized those young voices far too often. Instead of actually listening to and valuing young people, we objectify young people. And that's something that's so systematic that it has literally hurt us as people. Our responsibility now, as a generation, every single one of us, from the front row to where I used to sit in high school in the very last row, whoever we are, is to come together and find ways to actually build a movement for change that is real and concrete and measurable. And so the last C, I went from my personal challenge to real change to really young leaders like you saw Nisha on our video who graduated MIT in 2014 and she actually created her own nonprofit teaching design thinking to teens in Cape Town, South Africa. So she created from MIT a do it yourself uh, mobile device. So essentially a charger for mobile phones. It takes one hour to build. She designed it. I can connect you to her. You can see how she did it. But she brings that to teens in South Africa. The teens then bring their own ideas to pitch competitions. And the goal is to take those ideas out into the marketplace. But in all of that, in all of that, one of the key lessons we learned is that it's not just about being technically sound in any of your careers. It's also about having an open heart. It's about the values that you lead with. That's something that she learned and all of our student leaders learned because you can go in. I know you're doing the Innovation Expo, I think, tomorrow. And people will go in and say, hey, I can solve for this water challenge. Your project can be sound from an engineering standpoint. But if you haven't actually talked to a community, listened to a community, asked questions, involve them, then the change won't happen. And we've seen that firsthand. And so for me, that last C that I wanted to just close with around cohesion is fundamental. Because in all these travels that I've gone on and met with young people all over the world, there's something that's been uniform. And that's that certain voices have been left out. And this email is one of the most powerful emails I've received in my life. And I wanted to share it with you to close because when I think about cohesion, there are so many things that can bring us together if we choose to bring ourselves together. And this, this is the note that was shared with me. I'd given this talk in Morocco, and at the end of it, this young woman was very quiet the whole talk. She didn't say a single word. She was silent. And at the end of the talk, 
she emailed me this. She said, Dear Mr. Vagar, thank you for coming yesterday to Agadir. Your speech was pretty inspiring. I must confess that when I decided to go to the training, I was not really expecting to learn something, but I was wrong. I've learned that we shouldn't feel embarrassed to ask for help, and we shouldn't deny who we really are because we can never improve if we keep deluding ourselves. It was really courageous from your part to share with us your story, and I would like to share mine with you as well. I'll try to make it short. During most of my life, I was struggling to be normal, to act normal, and to try to prove that I am like anyone else. Even though I'm in a wheelchair. However, I live in a society that is not fully aware of what it means to be handicapped, and it applies to everyday life. For example, yesterday I was going to leave my school because the elevator wasn't working, and I did not want my father to carry me to the third floor, but he insisted, and I ended by accepting. What is really great about this country is that people are helpful when you ask them, but the infrastructure of most buildings does not make access easy for people in wheelchairs. Sometimes I think that to the government, I don't even exist. And the consequences are great to my family and friends, and when I say it, I mean all people in wheelchairs certainly live the same frustrations. Now I go to the university, and my class is in the second floor. There's no elevator. And each time, every single time, my father helps me to get there with the help of someone else, mostly classmates. To be honest with you, I am sick of having to cause trouble to people like that. I don't want to have them to have to think if the place I'm going to is accessible or not. And that's why I'd like to contribute to the creation of a community that acknowledges the existence of different persons and to make life easier for them rather than harder. There is a nonprofit, but it's located in the capital and their activities don't reach us. Two people and I tried to form a kind of sub association, a smaller nonprofit of this organization for the past two years, but we have not found anyone willing to help us. And I would like to ask, according to your experience, how is it possible to create an awareness in the heart of people? How is it possible? to create an awareness in the heart of people? And how can we instill ambition or rather willingness in our community to help improve the lives of people who are imprisoned in their little corners because the outdoor world does not have the requirements to welcome them? Again, thank you for your help, Layla. Layla's message... Layla's, Layla's message, Layla's message wasn't meant for me. It was meant for you. How do we create an awareness in the heart of people is what she asked me. And in turn, I ask that question to every single one of you. You have an opportunity with IYF to radically transform the world as it can and should be. That is the opportunity. And so, I would simply say to you, be empathetic, be humble, don't assume you have the answers, none of us have all the answers. We can learn together, we can learn from each other, but you better believe that there are young people just like you all over this planet who are making change real, who are doing it in a cohesive way. And if we build together, I promise, I know it's possible. And so I am so humbled and grateful to be with you. It is just the beginning. Thank you so much, World Camp and IYF. Really grateful. Thank you so much.